Right. Basically, the thesis is very simple. It's about the first book of translations into English of modern Chinese poetry, the first anthology, um, which was completed in Beijing in 1936 by Harold Acton, um, who was a professor teaching English there and one of his students, Chen Chixiang. Um, and the book of poetry ends up having a lot to do with um, a poetry group that was prevalent in China during the time, which makes it really interesting to kind of research who they picked, how they picked, what they thought of the different people in their book, and also how they translated these poems so that Westerners would read this poetry. Um, and I ended up finding some reviews, Chinese reviews of this book, which I thought was very interesting because you don't, of, you don't often find reviews of books that have been translated into another language Looking at who they picked and what poems they picked and how they picked these people, both Chen Zhichang and Acton really liked this modernist group. And so in their book, what you see is not only the poems and the people they pick are largely modernist. Of 95 poems, they pick 60 poems by this modernist group. But also they include important theoretical articles, translations of them by people in this group. So you can really tell that they are trying to promote this group of people. To first talk about the history or the development of vernacular Chinese poetry, um, at that time, between 1919 and 1936, there's not that much time, but there's a great deal of development in Chinese poetry. And basically what happens is you have your early poets who maybe are from 1919 to 1921, and they're basically just trying to write poetry in vernacular. So they're not really looking at technique, they're just trying to break away from um, traditional poetry. And then you have Guo Moro, who is the first person to really look at poetry as poetry, like thinking we are using the vernacular, but we're also actually writing poetry. And his stuff is very romantic and very Whitman-esque. It's free verse, it's really over the top. Um, and so in reaction to that, you have the New Moon Society with Xu Zhimo and Wen Yidu, and they think that you really need to control your emotions in poetry, and that it's more about technique. And then you get this modernist group, and the modernist group is more like French symbolism, I would say, than your really urban modernism of like T.S. Eliot, although T.S. Eliot and the Wasteland had a great impact in China at that time. Now, people obviously in the West didn't know anything about this poetry because it started in 1919, and people are very focused on traditional Chinese poetry as a way of fixing problems with the West and thinking that, you know, China is mystical and this sort of poetry is very mystical and the philosophy is mystical. So if we learn about traditional poetry, we'll kind of be able to fix our own problems and what happened in World War I. People are using this book as a way to understand um, Chinese literature and modern Chinese poetry. The only problem is because of the way that Acton and Chen Chixiang used very typical Western techniques to translate like alliteration, they added rhyme, things like that. The poetry ends up looking not exactly modern. They don't modernize the poetry, they just westernize it. Some people, they are talking about how they think, oh, this poetry has great rhythm, but the rhythm's actually in the, the English version, not necessarily in the Chinese version. So you can kind of see how the translation itself mediates how people look at these, this poetry. Uh, Chinese poetry at that time was so like French symbolist poetry, and French symbolist poetry is more difficult to understand. It's more obscure than anything else. Um, and it's not necessarily trying to shock you. And so I think that Chinese poetry at the time, if you read it in the Chinese, the images are really amazing. And it's really obscure. It's the obscurity of it that really catches you as being something maybe modernist. And that comes through in the English, but it's just, I think that it's just so much that it's not in Chinese. So sometimes when translating and using that flowery language, you get more of a Victorian feel than you do a modernist feel. At that time, a lot of people actually started translating modern Chinese poetry and short stories and novels. Um, and a lot of those translations, maybe in the 20s and 30s, were done in China. A lot of these English or American people go to China. They know how popular traditional uh, literature is in their home countries. But when they go to China, they see that there's this new movement. And so a lot of these people, they kind of join forces with literati in China at that time and help them translate their literature and they show this feeling that if they can translate this literature the West will finally understand that China is not just this mystical traditional country they actually are doing new things uh, with a new language. A lot of people who've talked 
at all about him going to China have immediately assumed that the reason that he went was because of this idea of spirituality. And another thing that people have noticed about Acton and his views on Chinese poetry are that he tends to like modern poetry that has a traditional feel or that has that has in some way inherited the tradition of kind of classical Chinese poetry. And a lot of people have said this is because he's obviously an Orientalist and it's all about the spiritual to him and he thinks he kind of mysticizes China. But something I noticed that's really interesting is actually at that time T.S. Eliot obviously has this very famous idea of tradition and the individual talent and that anyone who's writing modern poetry, anyone who's writing poetry at all should in some way inherit the past because if you don't know what other people were writing before you, there's no way you can develop and write new things. And that anything new is just a development of the past. So Acton, who's a big fan of T.S. Eliot and his criticism, obviously his idea of modern Chinese poetry and tradition is coming from this T.S. Eliot idea and not so much from a mysticism of the East. Basically for the people who wrote in Chinese about this book, they obviously are relieved that someone has finally translated this poetry, but because they're so, these people that are writing these book reviews, they're so knowledgeable about their own poetry background and about who they think is good and who they think is bad, and they also, because they can write these sort of reviews, they can look at this book and know whether it's good or bad, their English is obviously very good as well. So. I really think like if you compare the book reviews in Chinese to the book reviews in English, you can really see the people obviously writing book reviews in Chinese, they're talking about, they think that this book didn't pick all of the good poets, they should have picked more poets, they should have translated more poetry, and then some of the book reviews kind of start to rag on the, uh, the translation. Someone else writes an article about how they think that uh, they picked a lot of poets that Chinese, a like person making a Chinese anthology wouldn't dare to pick, and so he thinks this is a great thing. So you have a really a lot of different ideas going on based on this book in China, but they all show this high level of knowledge that obviously Westerners don't have. So the translations are just necessary, and at this time when I'm sure that the originals were not making their way to the West very easily or quickly, um, I think that it was just something that was necessary to get people even to know that they had these people writing these poems and to not think for the rest of their lives that there was only classical literature that was on the only literature worth looking at. And if you look at the fact that classical literature and classical, especially classical poetry, is constantly translated, I think that it was just something that seemed like it needed to be done and would have, if you said, well, if we translate it, it won't be loyal, it won't be right, so let's not do it, that would, I think, really just be sacrificing vernacular Chinese poetry and saying, oh, it's not worth it, let's not do it, and kind of never letting Westerners know what actually was out there at that time.